This is a carbon fiber kayak paddle, and in this video I'm going to show you how I built this, and at the end we're going to test it out alongside some commercially available paddles and just see how it stacks up. Here we go. Now, I really didn't know anything about kayak paddles, so the first step was to do some research. There's no shame in learning from somebody else's experience. So I read some blogs from people who'd built their own paddles, I read guides to help me understand what the different paddle shapes were for, and I checked out what the really high-end paddles were looking like. Holy cow, $450 is a lot to spend on a paddle. And then lastly, I went and looked at some paddles in person and did research in my normal, dignified manner. Taking everything I learned, it was time to design my paddle in CAD using Fusion 360. Now, I don't always design my projects in CAD first before building them in real life. Sometimes a hand sketch is good enough, or sometimes it makes sense to just start building. However, in this case, I think it makes sense to be able to see it before I build it in a 3D model to make sure I don't make any mistakes, work out the kinks before I start building. Fusion 360 is extremely valuable for that, and what's cool is it's free. If you're interested in learning how to use it for your projects, Bob at I Like to Make Stuff has a course designed specifically to teach newcomers and makers how to use Fusion 360 for making projects. And it's pretty affordable too. I'll throw a link to his class in the description. Speaking of courses, if you're brand new to carbon fiber and composites, I encourage you to check out my course. It's absolutely free, The Beginner's Guide to Composites at sasquatchcomposites.com. I decided to start the build with a handle, and for my mandrel I used a 1 inch Schedule 40 PVC pipe, 72 inches long. Now this was for a 94 and a half inch long paddle. So if you want yours longer or shorter, then go ahead and adjust accordingly. I cleaned the pipe with alcohol before doing anything else. I don't want a little bit of dirt permanently locking my part onto my mandrel. Next I grabbed some graphite powder and I rubbed that all over the mandrel to make it slippery and make it easier to slide the part off after cure. And then I very carefully wrapped the mandrel with plastic. Now I started with, with very thin drop cloth material and I realized very quickly that it was, it was just going to wrinkle up too much and it wasn't going to work out. So I stripped that off and I instead wrapped it with some vacuum bagging material which is actually about two thousandths of an inch thick. So a fair bit thicker than the drop cloth was, it worked a lot better. Note that I'm not taping my plastic to the mandrel all along its length. I'm taping the plastic to itself, and then I'm taping it to the mandrel just on the very ends. I want to be able to peel the tape off the ends when I'm done and slide the entire assembly off the mandrel. Next it was time to cut the fabric. I started with my 4.1 ounce unidirectional carbon. Now this is 12 inches wide coming off the roll, which gives me almost exactly three wraps around the mandrel. I cut it 66 inches long, or at least that was the plan. But when I rolled my fabric out, I realized I was short six inches. My roll is only 60 inches long. So rather than buying more material, which I really didn't want to do, I just decided to live with the shorter paddle. Next was my bi-directional layer. This is 5.9 ounce woven fabric on a 090 orientation. The piece is 9.1 inches wide, which gives me two wraps around the mandrel, and it's 66 inches long, or in my case, 60. And in fact, I didn't have a 60 inch long piece for this either, so I cut two 30.5 inch pieces and I overlapped them one inch in the middle. You can do that with composites, which is kind of nice. The result is five plies total around the mandrel, and this gives me a two to one safety factor. In other words, my shaft is twice as strong as I calculated it needed to be. And I thought this would be nice to have a little bit of extra margin just in case I messed something up. And spoiler alert, I ended up being really grateful for that extra margin. After a quick coat of mold release wax on my mandrel, I was ready to mix epoxy. For this layup, I mixed 170 grams of epoxy, which turned out to be plenty. And remember when spreading epoxy with a squeegee on unidirectional fabric, always squeegee in the direction of the fibers. If you squeegee 90 degrees to the fibers, you could make a really big mess in a hurry. Time to roll the fabric onto the mandrel. Now, this was supposed to be a fairly easy part, but remember back to earlier when I said I was grateful for the extra margin on the strength of the part? This is where it came into play. In fact, to really understand what happened, we need to rewind even further to where I said something really stupid. So uh, I could shim them up to make this these exactly even, perfectly flat if I wanted to, but for this, I don't think it's going to be necessary. I'm not doing any precision work uh, across the two tables, so I think we're going to be just fine with what we've got. Yeah, that was stupid. See, the problem is when you're rolling this up, you need to be able to apply pressure on the entire shaft as you're rolling it up. Otherwise, anywhere where you're not applying pressure doesn't get rolled up tightly. 
And that's exactly what happened here. One half of my shaft didn't roll nicely. The other half was just fine, but this half didn't roll nicely, and so it wasn't tightly wrapped, and when I went to wind it, it wrinkled and it made a big mess. Learn from me, make sure that your table is completely flat. But other than that massive hiccup, things went pretty well. And with it rolled all the way onto the mandrel, I was able to wrap it with this green stuff I got at Home Depot. Now yes, I could use actual heat shrink tape or something like that, but this was cheap and available and I could get it the same day. I'll throw a link to the stuff in the description. It actually worked really well. It's self-releasing from epoxy and it's a little bit stretchy which allows me to pull it pretty tight as I wind it. I set it up vertically to cure because I was worried if I laid it on the tabletop then I'd get a flat spot where it was resting on the table. I didn't want flat spots on my shaft so I stood it up vertically and taped it to the wall to make sure it wouldn't fall. Once it was cured the part had a pretty firm death grip on that mandrel. <laughs> So I decided to use one of the unique properties of carbon fiber to my advantage. You see, PVC shrinks when it's cooled. Carbon fiber, on the other hand, grows when it's cooled. So I threw it out in the cold winter air for about half an hour, and then quickly brought it inside and slid it off the mandrel. And it worked a peach. The garden tape released quite easily, revealing a tube with very wavy fabric from my poor rolling job. Oh well. I removed the bagging film from the inside by shoving a ruler in, twisting it around a bit to grab the film and then pulling it back out. I was worried about the tube being strong enough with all the waviness in the fabric, but I couldn't break it with my hands so I guess it's okay. Thank goodness for safety factors. Next it was time to make the blades of the paddle. I read on a forum that poster board worked really well for a hot wire template so I decided to try it and it worked. I did find though that if you let the hot wire sit in one spot for too long, it will burn a hole into the poster board, so make sure you keep it moving. If you want to build one of these at home, the template is really simple. All it is is an arc with a 60 inch radius, and the template for the center of the paddle it needs to be shorter than the template on the outside of the paddle. That's what creates the dihedral. Now you can make those 60 inch radius templates by tying a 60 inch long string to a pencil anchoring one end of the string and using it to draw an arc on your template material. Or you could become a Patreon supporter and get access to all the digital files that I used for my build. The foam blocks are 2 inches thick and they're 20.5 inches by 3.25 inches. And make sure again that the shorter template goes on the inside of the paddle, not the outside. I attached my templates with push pins and I used weights to hold the foam still while I pulled the hot wire through. I taped all the foam pieces together and then used my template as a guide to cut out the shape of the paddle. I then pinned strips of poster board around the outside of the paddle and I traced the outline onto the poster board. Then I cut it out. I then shimmed those templates up using quarter inch plywood. This will make the edges of my foam core a quarter inch thick. With the templates shimmed up and pinned on both sides, I again dragged the hot wire across, this time cutting the upper part of the foam. And the last thing to do before our layup is to sand the foam smooth. And if you find you've got a dent somewhere in your foam, you can actually fill that in with a lightweight spackle. Yes, the same stuff you'd put on your walls, and then sand it off afterwards. I wanted to reinforce the edges of my paddle blade, so I started with a strip of 1.7 ounce Kevlar, 48 inches long by 2 inches wide. If I did this again though, I'd probably just use 1 inch wide braided sleeve. Kevlar can be tricky to cut, but you don't need specialty scissors just for Kevlar. In fact, almost any scissors will work as long as they have the right treatment to them. All you gotta do is take the blade of your scissors and press it flat against the spinning disc sander for just a second. It doesn't take very much, all you're doing is you're roughing up the blade of the scissors just a little bit, and what that does is it allows the scissors to grip the fabric as it cuts so it doesn't slide instead. I have seen a pair of $6 Fiskars cut better than $100 Kevlar shears using this technique. With that done, I sprayed a generous coat of 3M77 onto the Kevlar, and I used a ruler to help me line it up as I pressed it down onto the carbon fabric. 
And as I said before, make sure this is on a 45 degree bias. If your fabric is cut 090, you will never get it around the curves that you need to get it around. With the two fabrics stuck together, I could then cut it out and cut the strip right down the middle, making two one inch strips 48 inches long. A quick spray of 3M77 on the cores and you can stick the two core halves together. Don't go too heavy on this or it will melt the foam. Just a light spray is all you need. Another coat of 3M77 onto the Kevlar side and I could place it onto my cores. This takes a little bit of time, it's a little bit tricky, but, but take your time and you can get it to lay down flat all the way around the entire paddle. For my skins I cut out two plies to go on each side of each paddle and I cut these a little bit big. I can cut off and sand down the excess later. I think that's everything so let's get sticky. And now we wait. Ah, the satisfying sounds of opening a freshly cured vacuum bag. Before trimming my paddles, I decided to go ahead and cut my tubes and get them ready to bond the paddles on. For this, I trimmed off the rough edge and then I measured 5 inches in and I marked another spot. The tube is going to overlap the paddle 5 inches. And I'm cutting the tube to match the curvature of the paddle blade. Now, I didn't have templates for this, I didn't have anything to help me with this. So what I did is I, I just drew as straight of a line as I could. I cut that straight line. I went in and I sanded and touched it up as needed until I got a good fit. It took some trial and error, but I was able to do it and get both sides lined up pretty well. I wanted no feather angle on mine, which means that the paddles are both going to be parallel to each other. To make sure that I got that, I clamped the blades onto the shaft and I laid it across two different tabletops and then just saw if it wiggled at all. It wiggled just a little bit, so I sanded a little bit more until it was flat and then it was ready for bonding. I bond prepped the paddle by sanding it and then wiping it with some alcohol. And then I mixed up a batch of epoxy thickened with colloidal silica. I mixed until it had about the consistency of Vaseline. I gooped on a generous amount, lined everything up, made sure it looked good and clamped it down. Now with the epoxy still wet, I used my popsicle stick to make a nice fillet of epoxy all the way around that joint. And I left it to cure. With the cure complete, I sanded everything smooth to get ready to put my two plies of carbon over the top of the joint. These two plies are going to be really important because the joint as it is is not strong enough. And I took this opportunity to trim all the way around the edge of the paddle and sand everything smooth. If you're building your own, as you're sanding those edges, you will know if you get down to the Kevlar. If you see any yellow, if you stop seeing black, it's time to stop sanding. Ideally you want to stop a little bit sooner than that because you don't want to sand through your carbon layer as well. But I did sand through in a couple spots and I was grateful to have the Kevlar to show me that I needed to stop right then. After sanding everything down and a thorough alcohol wipe to make sure it was all clean and dust free, it was time to lay up my plies. 
I laid up two plies on the backs of each paddle that extended a half inch past the end of the tube. Once the epoxy reached its green stage, meaning it's tacky, it's flexible, but it's not all the way cured, it's kind of in the in-between state, and at this stage you can trim it easily with just a razor blade. While the epoxy was still green, I mixed up some more epoxy with cabasil and some graphite powder to make it black, and I used that to fill in those radii. And with that still wet, I wrapped the entire base of my joint with carbon tow. This is there to help keep the paddle from peeling off under high loads. With that cured, the paddle is now structurally complete. However, I wanted to put a decent finish on it. So here we go, sanding time. And more sanding, and more sanding, and more sanding. I found that there were some pinholes around the edges, so I brushed some epoxy into there, and more sanding. Finally, I was ready for varnish. I applied several coats of Helmsman spar urethane using the exact directions on the can, and I realized my surface finish was not quite what I'd hoped. Initially, I thought, I'm going to be okay with this. I don't really need it to be super glossy, super fine, but it bothered me a lot. And so I went back to the sanding. I squeegeed some epoxy mixed with cabasil in there, thinking that would be a quicker way to fill in all those pinholes, but some of them were kind of deep, and you can see some spots in the finish where it's got a blue tint. That's that cabasil where it went on just a little bit thicker. I took a deep breath and just said, oh well. Sanded it again, and more varnish, and finally, finally, it was ready. And with that, it was time to test it. Now, I really, really wanted to try it out and compare it back to back with a high-end $500 paddle like I looked at when I was doing my research. However, it turns out nobody in my network is willing to spend $500 on a paddle. Nobody had one. But I do have a couple of friends who are avid kayakers who have some decent paddles, and they were willing to go out with me and test it out. One of them has done a bunch of sea kayaking, and the other one is an avid kayak fisherman. Seemed like a pretty good test to me. But before we get there, I want to thank my Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for the support that you've given me. It's the contributions that you make that make these kinds of videos possible. The money that I receive on Patreon goes directly towards supporting projects like this and instructional videos for this channel. So thank you for your support. And if you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, click the link down below and it'll take you right there. Patreon supporters are going to get access to all the digital files that I used in this build as a way of me saying thank you for your support. And with that, let's see how it worked out. So, I've got my friend Jim here. He has plenty of experience with kayaking. What do you think? It's extremely light. It's a little shorter than I'm used to and may not work for my particular kayak setup. Good thickness on the handle though. So mine's, mine's a lot thinner uh, handle-wise. So I, I think it'll be more comfortable in the hands. I'm just curious. Oh gosh, that is a noticeable difference. Yeah, huge difference. That is quite a bit lighter. That feels good. Cool, let's try them. All right. What do you think? It's easy to paddle with. Uh, yeah. The lightness makes it a lot better. It's got good control. It's easier to swing, it's easier to stir and kind of move sideways. Uh, like if you're trying to get up next to structure, it's just easier to maneuver. Like this is pretty expensive pedal, you know, and I feel like it's crappy now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's just like that could be longer in size, but 
I don't know, just like being lighter and being able to move better. I feel like it will be easier on the shoulders in the end of the day as well, if you're doing like long kayak trips. Weights and everything there. <laughs> I think uh, it, it's easier to get the kayak moving faster. I don't know if that's the blade shape or how much water's moving or if it's just easier to get back and forth because it's lighter. Um, but it takes, it took me a lot longer to get up to speed with the other one. Jim said he had a fish finder and that we could use it to measure his speed on the water, so figured we'd see if it made any improvement with the new paddle. So how fast? So I top out around 3.8 miles an hour, um, but the perceived exertion to get there with your paddle versus my stock paddle, it's like less than half. It's amazing how much of a difference that makes. <laughs> it does, yeah, and you know, if you're fishing all day or, you know, paddling for a couple hours, it's going to make a big difference in how you feel afterwards. Sure. As I said before, I would have loved to have a nice high-end $500 paddle to test this back-to-back -back with, but we didn't, so I can't draw any real conclusions about how this performs in comparison to one of those. That being said, there was a noticeable difference using this versus the paddles that my friends had, which were decent paddles, they weren't low-end paddles, and the biggest thing we learned is that weight matters a lot, especially if you're going to do a long extended kayaking trip. And at just over 19 ounces, mine is comparable with high-end paddles in terms of weight. Everybody seemed to agree that it would have been nice if it was just a little bit longer, which is to be expected because I built it short on accident. That being said though, it does move water effectively, and it is stable in the water, which is what we really wanted with that dihedral. The paddle seems to work pretty well, so I'm going to call this a success. If you built one of these on your own, tell us how it worked in the comments below. I'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you on the next one. Oh dear, where are my scissors? Where are you, scissors? I found you. Okay. Oh. We're going to test it out alongside some other... <laughs> really? Are you done yet? Show off. <laughs>